Hello and welcome all to the episode three of the GV Transfer Show. This is the one where we don't deal with just rubbish rumors, or we can rubbish the rumors, but it's mostly about trying to see what's the insight in the stories that are published in the press and tell you one or two that uh, haven't been published yet. Uh, we've got with us, of course, uh, Arya Yuyutsu, who is going to moderate this, and also with us in this episode, Julian Laurence, who, uh, well, if you say that he's just the Parisian uh, correspondent, you just do him a disfavor because he's actually much more than that, the man on the pulse throughout Europe. So, hello, guys. I'll leave it to you, Arya. Thank you so much. Yes, this is uh, GB Transfer Show episode three uh, in association with Football Index, of course. Um, it's nice to have Julien with us today, especially because I feel a strong French connection. I'm here in Pondicherry, which is a little French town in the, in the south of yes. India. But let's start off with uh, Emery's comments, uh, former PSG manager right now at Arsenal. Uh, we spoke about this in the previous episode, about how he sort of admitted publicly that they can only make loan signings, that they can't really buy anyone in January. Um, what's with Emery? I thought he looked. I thought he looked a bit upset and a bit angry in that press conference when he when he admitted that the only thing he could do right now was was having loan players. He couldn't sign anyone permanently. They could only look at uh, uh, loaning, you know, loanies to come into Arsenal. He wants to strengthen the squads. He knows the squads need some strengthening, need some reinforcement. The problem is the money is there, but maybe not as much as you thought it would be. Or as much as he needs, really, uh, and I think that that should be should be a disappointment for him. I'm not sure when he signed for the club back in May, that was exactly what he was told. But this is the situation anyway, you know. So he has to deal with it and try to do as as best as he can with the people behind him, like Sven Mislintad, you know, trying to identify players that could come. Uh, for, for a loan until the end of the season, for example, at Arsenal. Let, let me add to that the fact that um, Arsenal spent a lot of money in the summer, spent a lot of money in the previous transfer window in the in, in the winter transfer market with our Mayang, and spent a lot of money on three players, especially in terms of uh, in terms of wages, our Mayang, Ozil, and uh, Mikatarian. So the conditions were clear for this one that uh, there was they have to just um, try to fill the holes. Two holes, mostly, and not a centre-back hole, unless a bargain appears in the market. While in the summer, the good news for Arsenal fans is that in the summer, there will be money. Uh, in terms of players uh, linked to Arsenal or Arsenal players uh, and their future, uh, let me say that uh, Ramsey, uh, we all think that he's made a decision and it is Juventus. He's actually, it's decision between Juventus and another side, another team, and think of this one, uh, Julian, because I, I think it could be PSG. But uh, when other teams have come to uh, Ramsey and said, I've got a second chance to try to convince you, they've been told, no, 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 he's already done. So it's Juventus. It's going to be Juventus. But this second one, do you think it could be PSG with the need they've got for midfielders? I think they, they, were, off, they were offered uh, a lot of midfielders throughout Europe. Ramsey was, was one of them. Uh, Abdoulaye Ducouré from, from Watford, and they were offered players in the bracket of the kind of money they could spend. Ideally, PSG would love to go for N'Golo Conte and offer Chelsea, I don't know, 80 million euros, or go for Allen and offer Napoli 70 or 80 million euros. But they can't do that right now. They need to settle for the bracket of, of midfield, the defensive midfielder just below that, so between the 30 to 40 million euros maximum. And in those brackets, you have people like Idrissa Gay at Everton, like Ducouré at Watford. Aaron Ramsey comes in that because he's free, although there will be a signing on fee to pay and obviously the wages. But so in that bracket, a lot of players were offered to them. And I think they had a look, they had a look at Ramsey, and I think they kind of like the profile, which is different than anything they have. For example, Marco Verratti doesn't score goals. Uh, they would have someone very physical, pure number six, pure holding midfielder who who wouldn't score goal either. So the idea of having Ramsey with the more box-to-box -box midfielder who actually make those runs into the box, I think that appealed to them. But I'm not sure they pursued it that much and that they went further. Maybe because they knew already that Juventus were ahead of everyone else in the race. Or maybe because they thought 
the priority is really a number six here, and Ramsey doesn't really get into that. So for five. First one on that is Frankie the Young. Uh, is he headed to PSG? Is he going to be the next midfielder for them? He's 21 years old, playing for Ajax and highly talented, highly rated. Uh, Barcelona were also in for him. Julian, what's the latest on that? Uh, PSG are still quite confident, and that's why they're briefing that Frankie the Young will be a PSG player next season. They've uh, and Toro Enrique, the PhD sporting director, travelled to Amsterdam uh, last month twice, almost back to back, to see Mark Overmars, who is the Ajax sporting director and in charge of transfer there. He also had a sit down with, with the agent of, of Frankie de Jong, I think with the father of Frankie de Jong as well, who is very important in how Frankie de Jong deals with his career. And he looked at that time at least that PhD would be really ahead of everyone else in the race to sign Frankie de Jong. And there's a lot of clubs after Frankie de Jong, Manchester City, Barcelona, and, and Guillaume will, will, will come on that after. Now, PSG is still confident, but they can tell that other clubs as well have stepped up, the, stepped up their effort to try to convince Frankie de Jong not to go to Paris, but to go to their club. And I think there's a big battle ahead for PSG in between now and the summer uh, to try to stay ahead of everyone else to sign Frankie de Jong. Obviously, he can give them a verbal agreement right now, but ver verbal agreement can change very quickly in football. We know that. We've seen it before. So it would be very, um, how can I say, uh, it would be very fragile for PhD even to have a verbal agreement with Frankie de Jong and his team right now to say, yeah, yeah, we'll come to you in the summer because between now and the summer, a lot of things can happen. Barcelona can come up with a much better offer. Uh, Manchester City as well, Pep Guardiola can speak to the player. There's, there's a lot of things that can happen. However, they're still confident that Frankie de Jong likes the PSG project. He knows he will have a lot of game time there, which might not be the case in other European clubs. They really feel that he can bring a lot to their team. And that, you know, for both parts, it makes a lot of sense if Frankie de Jong comes to Paris in the summer. It is one of those that uh, we cannot be uh, saying exactly what's going to happen because, as uh, Julian is saying, Frankie de Jong knows what Barcelona is offering, for instance. Uh, he knows the personal terms he's happy with, and he would sign that under those conditions. But, of course, there is a third party here, which is Ajax. Uh, both Ajax and de Jong will like uh, a solution within the week where, in which they can actually say, this is what I'm going to do, so let's focus on the rest of the season with Ajax. And Barcelona feel also that they are... Confident, but perhaps not as confident as they were a couple of weeks back when they thought that they had convinced the player and that he was going to fight his way to get to Barcelona. So Barcelona, it's same as it happened with Griezmann, they've done everything they can do. They're not going to move from where they are. And now it's a matter for the young and for Ajax to the side. What's interesting is that uh, the Licht, the centre-back that everybody's talking about, it seems like he's going to PSG as well. And uh, there's a line being used in the Catalan press in which uh, De Jong and De Ligt wanted to play together, whatever they go next. So it'll be fascinating to see, because Barcelona are not uh, going for the centre-back. They don't have that much money. If both of them actually finish at the PSG, what do you think, Julian? Yeah, I mean, they, uh, for me, De Jong makes a lot of sense. There's no problem. They, they need a player like him. They need a midfielder like him. For De Ligt, as good as he is and as talented as he is, they've just spent last summer around 37 million euros for... Tilo Kerrer, the, the young German defender who's very promising, who's done well, although he keeps conceding penalties, which drives me mad. But apart from that, he's done well, to be fair, with, with Tuchel. And you already have Kimpembe, and you have Marquinhos, and you have, you've got Thiago Silva, who's getting older now, but who's still a very good player. So if you bring De Ligt as well, amongst that, you will have a lot of centre-halves, and yet Tuchel plays with three. So, OK, I understand you need covers and competition, and, and, but it will be a lot of money for someone who potentially could spend a lot of time, at least at the beginning, on the bench at PSG. So I'm a bit skeptical about signing them both, also for financial fair play reasons, because Frankie de Jong is going to cost 80, 70, 80 million euros. Matisse de Ligt is the same price, pretty much. So once again, you're going to spend over 150 million euros, only what, two summers after Mbappe and, and Neymar. So unless you send Neymar, to fund for De Ligt and De Jong, which I'm pretty sure is not the plan in Paris right now. I still, I'm a bit skeptical about them signing both. I think De Jong is the priority. If they can get De Ligt in financial fair play rules without, 
you know, having too much trouble, then yeah, maybe. But I, I would find that really surprising. Uh, apparently, Guillaume uh, de Jong was also the priority for uh, Barcelona. Uh, and that's kind of why they were stalling on the Rabiot deal. Uh, but this has kind of added a new complexion to the whole thing. Uh, they, they have negotiated with both of them, uh, with Rabiot and with de Jong. Uh, as I said, with the young, they reached a personal agreement. With Rabiot, they thought they had as well. And they don't think they're going to be able to get him right now. That will be at the end of the season. So they pay, they'll have to pay 10 million euros to uh, his mom, who is her, uh, his agent. Uh, but they're less confident about Rabiot, who, of course, is wanted as well by others, including Bayern Munich, for instance, than they are with the young. But, again, because of the uh, uh, negative situation of uh, Griezmann last season, you talk to Barcelona right now and they're like, we hope, fingers crossed, that at least one of them comes. But they, not, they haven't got the, um, the power in the market to be able to say, you come here because we're going to pay more than anybody. So they are uh, waiting for the decision of both of them. The thing about Rabio is PSG are pushing for a transfer now because they would lose him in the summer for free. If they can get 10, 15, maybe, I don't know, 20 million euros now, but then it would be amazing because the, the hierarchy, especially Nasser Al-Khalaifi, Otero Enrique, have frozen him out from the first team. You don't want to sign a new deal here? No problem, but you're not, you're not going to play anymore this season. And Tuchel, at the beginning, accepted that, no problem. Now... Tuchel is really thin in midfielders. And he's thinking, do you know what? Rabio is there. He's training. You don't want him to play. I get that. But I can actually use him. And he will be a benefit for our team because we're quite low on midfielders. And he's very talented. He's a very good player. And Tuchel is saying, you know what? There's other players like him in his position that are out of contract in the summer. And they still play. Ramsey, who we talked about, he's one of them. So why is Rabio? Why can I use Rabio when other managers can use their players who are out of contract in the summer? So if PSG can't sell him now, I think Tuchel is going to push to include Rabiot again back in the, in the match squad to be able to use him until the end of the season, especially if they don't sign another midfielder in January. But PSG are pushing to try to get some money in for Rabiot right now. That's why Bayern Munich, who seem more willing than Barcelona to pay something now, you know, a little transfer fee, seems to me that that's, that's an option that PSG are, are going for and trying to push. Right, so a lot of transfer activity had happening at the top of the league on table. Uh, PSG, of course, 13 points uh, ahead of Lille in second place uh, with two games in hand. Uh, but looking further down towards the bottom of the table, Monaco, they've gotten Cesc Fabregas and uh, I believe Batshuayi as well. Yeah, it's an interesting one. So Michi Batshuayi, he's not there yet. I believe he's on his way. Uh, Vadim Vasiliak, the, the Monaco vice president who, who runs the club on a daily basis, uh, confirmed on Sunday night on French television that Bashoi was going to come on loan uh, for six months from Chelsea. I, I still believe there's a few details to sort out between the two clubs. But Bashoi wants to work with Thierry again. He obviously knows Thierry from, uh, from the Belgian national team where they worked together for two years. So they've got a very good relationship. And, and Bashoi is the last piece of the jigsaw for Henri to uh, refurbish his team, basically. He wanted a centre-back. He got Naldo from Schalke, who is 36. Okay, I get that. And maybe raised a few eyebrows from a few people. Oh, really, Naldo? But he played his first game against Marseille on Sunday. He was very composed, very calm. He was, his positioning was great. You could tell how much serenity he brought to the back, to the back five. And you could see already why he's bringing to the team. And, and Henri was very happy with him. Then Thierry wanted Cesc. Cesc is one of his best friends. They share the same agent. They play together. They have a very good relationship and they wanted uh, to work together in a, in a sort of manager to play a capacity and see how that went. And Thierry very, very much sees Cesc as, as his leader, his spokesperson on the pitch, his, uh, his general, you know, really the boss of his team. And we saw that again against Marseille on Sunday. Cesc had trained only once with the team. He played the whole 90 minutes. He was very good. You could see how he was controlling the game. And that was for someone who is not really completely fit because he hasn't played much this season. So he says he's going to get better and better as he gets fitter and fitter. And Thierry knows that. And then there's the striker because Falcao is getting old. He's injured a lot. He just lost his dad. Uh, you know, <coughs> bless him. So he's going through a tough time. So Bashrawi would be the option for Thierry of physicality, pace, and a very good finisher. So if that, if, if Bashrawi comes through, then Thierry would have had 
the three players that I really wanted. And he also added a left back in, in Fode Balotore from Lin, who is a similar player to Benjamin Mendy and someone that Monaco really badly missed at left back. So then Thierry would have the team that he really wanted. Ronnie Lopez is back from injury. The last time he played in the league was in September, 2nd of September. So he feels like a new signing as well. And then you will see a much better Monaco team. And with that team, I think they would stay up without problem. Any other uh, legal uh, transfer news uh, stories coming in that, you know, I've definitely skipped somehow? No, I mean, Marseille are looking for a striker there. Marseille are a shambles right now. Uh, they drew against Monaco on Sunday, like I was saying. The fans protested, insulted the players, uh, threw bottles at them, um, all sorts of things. I mean, Florian Tova, the, the French international who won the World Cup, got so scared that he... He became so white, it looked like an aspirin. And he had to be literally taken out of the pitch by security because he was so scared that the, the ultras were going to come down and, and literally kill him. So the atmosphere at Marseille right now is so toxic. It's really bad. But yet they still need a striker because Mitro Blue and German are not good enough. And they're still hoping that Mario Balotelli somehow could be convinced to go to Marseille. I mean, I say Balotelli, it's more Mino Raiola that has to be convinced to let Balotelli go to Marseille. Marseille believe they can somehow work out a, a, a transfer structure where they can get him and pay his wages. You know, he's on around 4.5 million euros a year, which is a lot of money. But Marseille believe they can, they can put that together to, to try to sign him. Would, would Balotelli want to go to Marseille? That's another question. Would Mino Raiola want Balotelli to go to Marseille? Again, that's another question. But Marseille seems quite confident that they can still get this one over the line between the end of the month. Well, let's go on to topic number three, that is uh, Jose Mourinho's return. Uh, he's, well, Manchester United have had six games on the trot, six wins on the trot since uh, Mourinho's gone and Solskjaer has come in. Uh, they just won against Spurs right now over the weekend. Does anyone want Mourinho now, given the toxic nature that he had? He had hopes of going to PSG. What's with that? Jose Mourinho will be wanted until the end of his career. There is no doubt that there is always a place for him. I'm looking into this into a lot of detail. I'm talking to sports psychologists, to players that played under him, uh, that players that played against him, managers that have uh, developed with him, because it seems to me like he's in a little bit of, um, of a crossroad, a little bit stuck. Uh, is he going back home to learn some more of his mistakes or does he think that um, everybody else is at fault? Anyway, let's see what comes out of all those conversations I'm having. But uh, of course, the one that has been rumored uh, to be wanting him is Real Madrid. I just don't see it. I don't see it. I know that he's got admirers at Real Madrid. I know that Real Madrid are going through a transition. Uh, but the kind of transition that he will want to lead is one that uh, will require the kind of money that Real Madrid don't have anymore. Uh, I think it's the threat of Mourinho, which, um, which Real Madrid want to use inside the camp so everybody works very hard and, uh, and then he ends up not coming, than, uh, than a real uh, factor. But I heard a rumor for a long time, uh, the close links between certain agents and clubs uh, is something that worries many. But uh, one of those links for a while has been PSG and Georgia Mendes. And about four or five years ago, I heard that uh, there is a path for Jose Mourinho, which this is before he went to Manchester United, that he was going to go from Chelsea to Manchester United, then to, then to a very big European club, uh, that that will be PSG. Then perhaps Inter, Real Madrid, we'll see. But that PSG was in the equation. I don't know, if Julian, if you, if you see that happening at some point and if it makes sense. Yeah, you're right. He was he was very close. I think I mean twice they tried to get him, and twice I think the timing was a bit wrong for him, especially. I think now PSG have moved have moved a long way away from Jose Mourinho. Uh, I think the style of football wouldn't go with what the Qatari and the the Emir of Qatar, who's you know funding the club, would want the team to play like. That's why he went for Tuchel because Tuchel has a much more expensive, high press, high energy style of football than Jose Mourinho, for example. Then also, I think a lot of people in Paris acknowledge that Mourinho brings with a lot of baggage and that in two years' time, you don't know how your club is going to look. It could look very toxic. It could, it could bring success to you and he's still a very successful manager and he's still a very good manager. But there's also a lot of negativity that could come with him, uh, with, with his dressing room, with other people working in, in, at the club. 
And I'm not sure they're ready to take that risk because it would be a big risk for anyone right now to take Jose Mourinho on with what happened at United, but also what happened before at Real Madrid, what happened at Chelsea before. I think it would be a, a, a big, big risk for anyone to take him on, back him up with a lot of money and let him you know, run the club basically like he's done yeah. in recent years. The problem is when a big decision has to be made, like for instance, Ed Woodward had a big decision uh, when uh, when he decided to go for Jose Mourinho. He contacted two young, very um, very good coaches, managers, decided to go for the experience for Jose Mourinho, even though two of the biggest directors, uh, one of them chairman even, of two of the biggest clubs in Europe told Ed Woodward, don't go that way. But even so, it gets to a point where it's like, yeah, but it has to be him because Jose Mourinho knows how to make, through the media, one of those situations that is Jose Mourinho or chaos. So Edward Ward went for Jose Mourinho. But we'll see. Real Madrid have got this little dream. I don't know if it will happen, but let's put it out there of um, convincing Allegri to come to Real Madrid. Uh, so then the second part of that is Zidane going to Juventus. It's just a, it's just a talk. There hasn't been conversations yet on that. But uh, I thought I'd just put it out there just in case. Okay, so let's uh, move on to topic number four there quickly. Then, uh, Llorente to Athletic Bilbao. Uh, Llorente, well, the, the, the bit that probably has just fallen out of place here is uh, Harry Kane's injury. And uh, Harry Kane's out. Uh, Son's going to be in the Asia Cup. Is Llorente even available right now? No, he's not available. But quite clearly, Athletic Bilbao wanted him and he thought... Yeah, why not? What's interesting here, he won't go now because he's needed at the Spurs. But what's interesting is that he devised the fans of Aleti Bilbao. Uh, he was he left almost as a, as a villain. And going back uh, meant that a lot of people don't want to see him again wearing the Aleti Bilbao shirt. He's an Aleti Bilbao fan. He would love to go back. It's not going to be now. Let's move on to the topic number five. Um, that's Real Madrid. Uh, you have uh, a lot of youngsters going into Real Madrid. You have Brahim Diaz, who a lot of people have been uh, asking about on Ask EM, of course. Uh, and uh, there's Christoph Piontek. Tell me if I'm uh, pronouncing his name wrong. Um, uh, what's this change in policy? Uh, are they now going for youngsters rather than the big star Galacticos? Piontek has to do with the fact that, of course, he's doing so well in Italy with Genoa. But actually... Uh, it looks like Milan are favourites in a 90% to get him. He feels that a jump to Real Madrid is far too high right now. And going, staying in, the, in Serie A with a club like uh, Milan, this is if Iguain leaves eventually, it would be a better decision for him. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of Raheem, what you've got is a player that was offered by Real Madrid double the wages, double the wages that uh, Manchester City were offering him. So he's earning 3 million euros net. This was one of the reasons why he's gone to Real Madrid. Secondly, because he's Real Madrid. Thirdly, because he's a Real Madrid in this array. So it, it is a time to make an impact, of course. And, uh, and just generally the fact that um, Manchester City have known for a while that he was leaving and they couldn't convince him. So they haven't done much of an effort. They, off they offered the possibility of sending him on loan to get more minutes. He said no. So now for him, is is trying to impress at Real Madrid. But something that's very interesting in terms of contracts, um, because you cannot get a professional contract in England until you are 17, I understand. And the longest you, you can do it is for three years. That leaves clubs like Manchester City, who put so much effort into making Brahim what he is, in, or partly what he is, or improve him, or make him a professional. Uh, the players can get at 18, 19 and say... We're not signing another contract and then leave for free. So that's something for FIFA, UEFA to sort out and to allow either longer contracts or some other ways for actually the clubs that have put so much effort into the, these guys to um, to get some kind of benefit out of it. Well, actually, they got 25 million euros from Real Madrid, so it's not too bad. But you know what I'm trying to say? If you want to develop at a club, it'd be better if they, they those contracts can be a little bit more flexible. I remember when the when City managed to, to sign him from Malaga. At the time, he was he was the wonder kid in Spanish football. He was really young. It was the time where, from Spain or from France, from Portugal, all those youngsters were going very, very young to abroad, uh, which is a big risk. It's always a big risk because you never know how that is going to turn out. You know, from someone like Brian Diaz not speaking English to come to Manchester from Malaga, and I'm not just talking about the weather. It's a hell of a change. Uh, uh, but yeah, he seems to have adapted so well. He's obviously a very talented kid. He plays in the youth 
in the youth league. He played in, with City in the youth camp. I mean, they won so many things at the youth level. But yeah, you always felt, OK, maybe give him a chance now, you know, making him play a bit more with the first team. And I, I wonder if, like Jadon Sancho, Brahim at some point thought, you know what, Phil Foden is clearly the one who will have his chance for this club. And that's fair enough. Maybe they can only pick one of all of us. Jadon Sancho felt the same. He left to Dortmund. And Brahim Gal probably felt the same and went to, to Real Madrid. I think it's, there's, there's always a market for those players. And I think when City signed him for Malaga, they knew that even if it didn't work out for him at City, they would be able to sell him like they did for still a lot of money. When you look at Dominic Solanke, who left Liverpool for £90 million to go to Bournemouth, you're thinking, and, you know, they got him for almost nothing, Liverpool at the time, and he hardly played for them. You're thinking, yeah, there's a market for all those young players, wherever they come from, if they're a bit talented, and Brahim is very talented. So maybe all in all, everyone is happy. Real Madrid are happy, Brahim is happy, and City are happy with the money that they got for him. Guillaume, I also wanted to ask you a little about uh, Casilla, who's um, Kiko Casilla, of course, um, the goalkeeper who's moved to Leeds, uh, Leeds top of the table uh, in the championship. Casilla going there, that's qu quite a move, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one to finish this uh, GB Transfer show with because it's the closest to be confirmed. He's travelled to Leeds already. Uh, he will pass a medical very soon. Uh, you know, you, 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 you cannot hide anymore with this thing. So he got a plane and, of course, he went through security and people recognised him, started taking pictures and there I go, that went on social media. That was it. Everybody knew that he was going to Leeds. But uh, the agreement, as we announced uh, here, was uh, for zero transfer fee. Uh, Real Madrid are letting him go for free. That's another good job from Victor Horta, uh, uh, the, secretary, the technical secretary of, uh, of Leeds. And he's somebody that should go into the team almost straight away. Let's see how rusty he is, because, of course, he hasn't played a lot with uh, Real Madrid uh, lately. But in my eyes, he's one of the top five goalkeepers in Spain. In terms of uh, being modern, anticipating, he's, uh, he's a proactive kind of goalkeeper. He's tall, so even though um, I think foreign goalkeepers feel a little bit unprotected in the six-yard box in England. By the way, the rules say that they should be protected, Referees in England decided that, no, no, it doesn't matter the rules. Uh, so that he's going to have to adapt to that a little bit. But uh, even so, good uh, uh, shot stopper and can play with his feet as well. So the, the perfect uh, strike, uh, perfect goalkeeper for a team that uh, does need a goalkeeper of that maturity and, and experience to push on to get promoted. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Julian, for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you, Guillaume. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. This is uh, GB Transfer Show, of course, in association with Football Index.